The following program is a presentation of BaseNet Internet Television. Welcome, everybody, to this week's Crashing Glass podcast. In honor of Memorial Day, we've got a real Navy chick on with us today. And, of course, I am your host as usual, Holly Hurley, with my co-host, Jill Henley. And joining us this week is Vanessa Perrine. Hello, Vanessa. Hello. So we are super honored to have you with us this week. And, guys, just so you know, Vanessa sounds a little fuzzy. She's joining us by phone. A busy mother of, uh, well, sort of mother of two, more or less, these days. Uh, She's got quite a lot going on on her end of things. So we're so glad you could join us. I'm glad to be here. Awesome. So I guess, you know, starting out, Vanessa, if you just want to tell us a little bit about, um, you know, which branch of the military you were in and what your position was like, all that sort of stuff. Well, I was in the Navy. And I was a hospital corpsman, which is basically a medic or a nurse, glorified nurse, as you may put it. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And I just, I don't know. (laughs) That was my job. I just drew blood and took vitals and saw sick call. Vanessa, were you? Uh, would you tell us a little bit? Um, I'm a geography person. That's how I like how my brain works. Would you tell us um, where? Uh, well, where were you were stationed? The different places, whether you were stateside or abroad, and then and where are you? Where are you coming from now? Where do you live now? Well, right now I live in Wascom, Texas. Uh, I just bought a home here, so oh, I'm cool. finally planting my feet somewhere. <laughs> My first command, I was stationed in San Diego, California, at Miramar, and I was with the VMSA 232 Marine Corps Air Flight Squadron, and we went on deployment, a six-month deployment to Japan, and part of that deployment, we went and saw Korea. On our way there, we hit Hawaii and Wake Islands, and after that, I went to x-ray school, and then I got stationed in Charleston, South Carolina where I was stationed there for two years and terminated my shore duty to go back to sea. And I got orders to the USS Emory S. Land in Madalena, Sardinia, Italy. Wow, that just, you know, some people I hear say they joined the Navy to see the world. I think you actually accomplished that. (laughs) Well, there was a few places I didn't get to see, but they're still open for negotiation. (laughs) (laughs) So what year did you go into the military? I went in in 97, August 97. Wow, so that was right out of high school, yeah? Yes. And what made you decide on the military? Like, what was what was the big drive, especially for the Navy? Well, uh, my family is a strong military background, mostly Marines. And I was going to join the Marine Corps until my dad threatened to kill me. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, Marines, course, Marines is just a short way of saying my ass rides in Navy equipment, yes? Is that, is that what I heard? Yes. <laughs> I haven't heard that one. That's good. <laughs> it is. Um, we transport them wherever they go. But um, my brother was in the Navy, and he said that it wasn't bad, so I went ahead and joined the Navy. And, of course, I found the only rate in the uh, the job title in the Navy to be stationed with the Marines, which my dad told me to stay away from. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it always works out that way. I remember telling my dad when I was younger, after I saw G.I. Jane, I was like, oh, I'm so going into the military. And my dad was like, no, you are not. And so then I said, okay, I'll just go to NYU. And he was not happy about that decision either. <laughs> <laughs> but he'd already given me a one big no, so... That's right. So he had to go with what I chose instead. It's probably not quite as dangerous, but in his mind, equally scary. Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. So, Vanessa, um, tell us a little bit about, um, you know, how you how you ended up being, basically, as you put in a medic or a glorified nurse, like how, how did your position come about? Well, before you join, you always pick um, a job title or a rate, as we call it. And I had chose Radio Man, which was basically working the radio And when I went to boot camp, they said I didn't score high enough on the ASVAB to become a radio man. So my two (laughs) options were a cook or a corpsman. So, of course, I chose the medical field. (laughs) (laughs) 
And now, it, did you develop a passion for it there? Because I know you're, you're, you're still working in medicine now, yeah? Yes. And you're I'm a nurse. Uh, yeah. And where, where are you working these days, if you don't mind? Marshall. Uh, well, Good Shepherd, Marshall. Oh, very cool. Um, doing anything fun or special or just basic general nursing? I don't know the difference. Well, yeah, I take care of, I'm in inpatient surgery, so I get all fresh post-op patients or patients before they go to surgery, and then I'll get them back after they have surgery. Oh, that so, must be interesting work. You know, well, just, interesting. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. No, what did you say? I said, go ahead. Oh, well, I was going to ask you, so how does that compare, like, doing the, you know, the pre-op and the post-op with, and obviously you see the patients before and after, so you're, you're a friendly face for them when they wake up, um, and how does that work compare in terms of the, uh, I don't know, the emotional attachment or the, you know, just kind of the, all the different types of, you know, the, the physical part of it, is it more physical or less than what you did in the Navy? Well, actually, um it's more stressful and more physical as a nurse than it was as a corpsman. Because as a corpsman, because we are all government property, we practice on each other, doing IVs, drawing blood, sewing each other up, uh, yes. that type of stuff. Nursing is a lot more than just doing that, taking vital signs. You know, I have to monitor these patients to make sure their O2 sats are up if make sure they're not getting a fever and infection and hanging their antibiotics, making sure they get their pills, making sure they get up and walk after they've had surgery so they don't get pneumonia. Yeah. So, it's so you're really, like, responsible for their well-being really after post-op. So, it, it, you know, that, that's a big, that's a lot, a lot on your shoulder. Yeah, it really is. <laughs> so, Vanessa, when you went in, like, when you first started, did you find that the options that were given to you were any different? I mean, I've, I've always wondered. I know things are changing in the military, but there's still this aspect of, like, having to be in war and being of different sexes and different types of people and kind of cramming them all together. Did you, what were your, when you were going in as a woman, did they give you different options? I mean, is it different in the Navy than it for a woman than it would be for a man? Well, there are certain job titles that a woman cannot get um, because they don't allow women on the front line of any war or any danger zone. So right offhand, I mean, I, I can't think of a job title that a woman can't get. They just don't send you to the front line. So That's like really me being with the Marines, I wouldn't have been able to go with a as they call it, a grunt unit, which are the people that go in and blow stuff up first. That's because really they're actually, Yeah, they're actually in harm's way. Now, is there, is there a reason, is there, I mean, obviously, I know they don't always give you reasons for stuff like this, but do you know, is there, like, a specific reason? Is it chivalry, or is it, like, a, or is it like a genuine, like, it's just too much of a distraction, or I'm sure there's a really good battlefield reason for that, right? Well, the, what I got um, out of arguing with people was, one, they're afraid that a man would try to protect the woman instead mm -hmm. of doing his job. And then there's always the distraction part where, you know, the you have to have separate toiletries and dressing areas and grooming. And it, when you're living in a trench, it's kind of hard to accomplish so a little bit of both. Wow, that's, I never, it's so funny because we talk about, I, we talk about a lot of things, but I can think of very few gender issues that are more life or death than they would be in the military. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it, it, it is, it's fascinating. And I, I mean, you know, you, Vanessa, you went in where, you know, you were, there was, you know, a lot of women had served. Uh, but I mean, were, were you? I assume that you were still a trailblazer in some ways because I mean, you went. You said 90, 1997 when you went. Yeah. When you, uh, so I'm sure you were still. I mean, what was the ratio uh, of you know, like in the in in the in the group that you traveled with or that you were with? Uh, what was the ratio of men to women? Well, my first command, it was probably 25 percent was women. The rest oh. was men. Okay. Wow, 25%? So, yeah. Wow, about a quarter. I was on a Marine base, and so there weren't very many women Marines, and there weren't very many women that went with the Marines. Uh, they 
you know, we had a lot of women go through the training to get stationed with the Marines, but they didn't pass. Oh. So, because it's, it's quite trialing, five-mile runs at four in the morning. Right. Oh, um, wow. Yeah. So you have to have, I mean, this is what I've always thought, um, so, so, uh, unique and, in um, special about the military is that the combination of physical toughness and mental toughness and a lot of jobs, you know, you've got one or the other, or some jobs have a combination, but it, not to the degree that you have to have to go through boot camp, right? I mean, and I, you know, I mean, you can tell us more if, if you, if you don't mind about the boot camp and sort of how, how it goes and what kind of, re- how does the respect go as you, you know, as you go through, do, you know, is it, does it really, uh, do you, does everyone start out and sort of they're at the bottom of the, you know, and then they, as they prove themselves, I mean, I guess I'm always curious about someone who's really been through that. Yeah. Well, boot camp was, it was difficult and it was difficult physically and mentally. They had to teach you to be obedient and at the same time be respectful and able to do your job. So basically they break your break your spirit down and then build you back up the way they want you. Where you'll have a strong mental aspect, mindset and obviously the physical part with all the PT, but it's kind of trialing. You're always being yelled at. I don't, I don't feel like anyone actually disrespected me. They were just training me. That's a, I that think that's sense. probably a wise way. Yeah. To think about it <laughs> for battle basically, or for life, life in the military, really. Yeah. Did you feel like, and I mean, this is obviously with whatever you're comfortable sharing, did you ever have any trouble at boot camp being being a woman, or did any of the women that you were in boot camp with have trouble that would be different from what a man would have? No, I honestly can't say that it was. I mean, they were, we That's were treated awesome really, <laughs> pretty equally. Uh, was, I, I got, as we called it, uh, thrashed just as much as the men did. They drop a woman just as quick as a man, so they call that not getting more Yeah, that, that's what. Yeah, it's eight count bodybuilders, push ups, jumping jacks, whatever, right there, and they'd make you do it for however long they felt you needed to do it. Which wow. I had to do it for two hours on the quarter deck for walking across the quarter deck. Oh, well, I guess that's a good way to teach somebody. <laughs> it, it definitely. I didn't do that again. <laughs> I found it really interesting. I had um, one of my first trainers that I ever had was a ex drill sergeant, and we used to tease him that his wife was a much harder trainer than he was, that she was much meaner than him because she was also an ex drill sergeant. And he actually said to me one day, he's like, you, you don't understand, like, with my recruits, with my men, I can kick them in the face, I can step on their backs, I can push them to the ground, I can't do that with you guys. <laughs> you know, he said, you know, Lynn knows how to talk to women. Lynn knows how to be tougher to women outside of a combat mentality. He said, but, you know, I'm used to training people for life or death, and I, I can't be as mean to you guys as I want to. Uh, so he had to call, he, he didn't know how to do it without, <laughs> without brute force. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much, which I thought was really interesting. I mean, he was an old-timer. He had been in the military like 45 years by the time he retired, so you well, see, he was much older than he looked. <laughs> I think one thing they take into account when they're training is some women may argue, but women are not built the same as men. Our physique is not the same. So we're not capable of doing some of the physical activities that men are. Not to say that we couldn't work our way up to it, but the average woman can't do everything that a man can do. Yeah, it comes down to muscle mass, right? It really is about muscle mass. Right, and I mean, anyone can train themselves to do that, but the average woman is not going to be able to lift 200 pounds, you know? So I think they take that into account, too, when they're training them. They can push a man so far, but a woman's only capable of doing so much. Right. I don't know, that kind of sounds sexist, but... Well, no, it's it's just genetics, you know, or it's just it's just the way it is. And I, I, I you know, I say that a lot, it, you know, it, to bring this to, you know, to for my mom point of view, <laughs> which I know is part of my job here on this Crash and Glass podcast. 
that I so I have a son and a daughter, and I want to raise them to be physically, you know, I want to raise them to be mentally, emotionally, you know, as strong and as smart as they can be. And physically, I want them both to be really strong people. Like, I mean, physically strong, you know, and, and a good athletes. And, and I sometimes stop and think, you know, how am I going to, what am I going to say to my daughter, you know, as she's, or, or should, let me say it this way. What my son will often say, oh, well, boys are better at sports. You know, he already says this. He's only eight or nine years old now uh, as of yesterday. You know, what, what boys are boys are better at sports. And I'm like, yeah, not necessarily. <laughs> but it's hard. It's kind of a hard it, because there is that, you know, there is that thing about muscle mass and size. And, yes, a man can lift more weight than a woman can. You know, like you said, the average man can than more more than a woman so it it, some of it I think that it's interesting for you Vanessa to have been through boot camp and to have been through this experience because you you know it better than any of us you know you know I mean there's there's equality you know there's I mean it's an equality that it's 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 not a perfect equality yeah it's not because men have more testosterone than women do and testosterone helps build muscle and that's just reality of it. Yeah. Now, yeah. you know how there's so many boot camp, uh, you know, they call and that's the name, you know, the, these new classes springing up at gyms and in all over the country called boot camp. And, you know, and people, you know, set up their careers on these, like becoming boot camp instructors and certified. And what is, so being ex-military, someone who actually went through boot camp, what do you, when you hear that, when you hear about these classes and about people training what do you what is what do you think well i think they just have them in there doing aerobic exercises anything that will bring their heart rate up to do basically it's cardio <laughs> because i it, it isn't what boot camp is all about boot camp is half physical and half schooling i mean yeah. we sat in a classroom for eight hours a day right but we also pt'd the rest of the time Right. So when I when I hear that boot camp, it's like that is not boot camp. <laughs> that that's just burning a calories. Yeah, yeah, it's a cardio class. Yeah, yeah. And what would you say? Like, is there a difference between when you're on base and you were here? You know, I know you spent some time here on base. You spent some time out in deployment. Um, and did and did you get just did you spend any time like on a on a vessel at sea? Yes. Uh, when I was in Italy, I was on a ship, and we deployed out to sea for a month at a time. Well, not for a month at a time, but for about a week or two out of every month. We never went on any long deployment because we were a, a sub-tender, so we had subs that would come pull up next side of us, and we would fix them if they were broken, or usually that was the reason is something broke on the sub, and we had to fix it. Oh, wow. So when you were, what would you say the differences in your duty between, say, being at base, being deployed, and then, you know, when you're out actually on the sub, was there a difference at all? Oh, there was a huge difference. When I was stationed <laughs> with the Marines, uh, there was a mutual respect. Everybody was helpful. Everybody wanted to join in and, you know, get the job done as a team. When I was on the ship, it was just the command. There wasn't a whole lot of teamwork. I had a lot of higher-ups, supervisors that didn't believe that women should be on ships. Oh, so, nice. And they didn't hold back their tongues um, letting us know that either. So that was a bit of an issue. But we worked through it and just had to learn to ignore them and bite our tongues. Wow, Which is, how do you work in that environment, you know? Like, it wasn't easy. Job done, you know? Well, my dog was an x-ray tech, so whenever someone would make some kind of remark about women don't need to be here on the ship, then I would just turn around, walk away, and go in my little hole and stay there. (laughs) So in a lot of ways, you were kind of fortunate that you had that kind of job where you could kind of go and, you know, hide out. (laughs) Yeah, I I didn't have to face it because there wasn't anything I could do about it. I'd already complained to everybody that I could, and nothing was done about it. So uh-huh. it just some people have that idea that women shouldn't be in the military, and uh, someone that has been on a sub their whole career for 20 years have been on a submarine where females aren't allowed, and then they're on a ship, get thrown on a ship where, you know, 
about more than about half the crew was female, it's uh, an adjustment for them. And some people adjust better than others. Yeah, some people are more open-minded, I guess, than others. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, it's a good point, though. So women aren't allowed on the subs, and if they'd spent their career as a Navy and in, in stationed in right as a what's the name of when you're on a sub? What is what the name that they call? Well, the, they they just call them. A lot of them are some of them are nukes. I mean, every job is has a job on the sub. I mean, hospital corpsmen are on a submarine, but they're all men. Okay. They're not females. They usually okay. have what's called a IDC or an independent duty corpsman, which is basically a physician assistant. They see patients, they give them medicine, they diagnose them and all that. So that's what they usually have, and they'll have a doctor on board. But they have all the rates down there, too. Okay. But they're always met. All the medical corps people are men on the sub. And, Vanessa, so just, just out of curiosity, what, what kind of time do these people, these men spend on the sub, how many weeks before they're, they're coming up? And, you know, what, is that, what does that look like? Some of the sub guys said that they had been underneath the water for six months at a time. Oh, my goodness. That takes, that's amazing. I, I mean, that is amazing to me. I could see that just driving somebody bananas. <laughs> yeah, I yeah mean, and we got, to, we got to tour the subs, and it's pretty uh, claustrophobic down there, to say the least. Yeah. I, I mean, that takes a lot of composure. I mean, that's composure, like. I mean, I, is the training different than for someone who's going to spend that ton of time in the submarines? I'm not sure if they have to go through a specific training to be on a sub. I mean, I know they have to have certain certifications like fire safety and electrical safety, that type of stuff, because it's a, if, you know, something catches fire, it's, you know, either put it out or die type of deal. But I'm not sure if they actually have to, a school where they have to go to to learn to be on a sub. But obviously, they go through screening processes before they'll station them on the subs. Yeah. Oh, that's what I was getting at, that maybe it's a different type of screening. Yeah. Wow. Oh, well, yeah. And they have to... I know I had a friend in the military who had a uh, skin disorder that he couldn't be, like, on the sub for too long at a time because his hands would crack and bleed. And he was an engineer, so he kind of needed his hands. <laughs> wow. It's, I mean, you, things you would never think of, right? Because... I don't know, being underwater that long just sounds crazy, but... Yeah. Well, I mean, people with asthma, not that, you know, a lot of people in the military have asthma, but, you know, if they had asthma, they wouldn't be able to be on a sub. It's dusty, and even though you clean it thoroughly all the time, there's still going to be dust, and if they went into respiratory distress, I mean, they they can't get help right away. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, so I, I have a bomb of a question. I don't know if um, if you want to comment or not, but let us know either way. It's I just as we're talking about women in the military and and you being you know you being part of that and and, and running into to, to the lifers that you know who like you said who had, weren't used to that and didn't didn't like it once they got up on the ships and they didn't appreciate women being serving with them. Um, but what about the don't ask, don't tell thing? You know, is that something that you have strong opinions on? I I have a differential opinion on that. I think that don't ask, don't tell was good in one way because people shouldn't be stereotyped by their sexuality, for one. Their lifestyle does not affect anyone else's lifestyle, and as long as it remains that way, it shouldn't become an issue. Then doing away with the don't ask, don't tell, I'm, I've always been afraid that somebody that is open about you know, their sexuality might get beat up in the night or beat up after leaving a club or something because they're gay. Mm-hmm. You know, whether, because there were some people that I served with that I was with for two years and never knew that they were gay. Right. Until after the fact, after I left them, I'm like, wow, how did I miss that? <laughs> right. But I, I think that the don't ask, don't tell was a good thing. But then there's, there's also the equality, you know, they should be able to be who they are. So I'm kind of torn on that. It's I look at it both ways. Right. Yeah, I can see your differential opinion. It makes sense. From a civilian standpoint, you know, I, I thought when, I guess it was President Clinton, right, that during his 
uh, administration, they came up with that don't ask, don't tell. And I thought it was brilliant because, I mean, I was like, I kind of, I thought, well, you know, that's a great way to, to handle it because it, it wasn't going to go away, right? The, with, you know, gays wanted to serve and it, and it, that, that issue was going to be there. And so I thought it was a brilliant way to, to, to deal with it. And I guess when you were there and you were serving it, you felt like it, for the most part, it worked. But yet it it still it works in terms of the everyday practicality, but it doesn't work for the people who have to hide who they are. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Uh, yeah, I agree with that statement. <laughs> and I guess I guess where that's concerned, was there ever a time where where you had to deal with that kind of fear just from being a woman? I mean, just be fair. Well, there yeah. were there were some times in boot camp where I was in the shower. And I'd have a girl just kind of looking at me kind of crazy. <laughs> and I'm kind of thinking, okay, is she just messing around or is she serious? Yeah, let's just get out of the shower. <laughs> <laughs> so for you, not necessarily from the, from the opposite sex, but some maybe even from the same sex where you just weren't sure and you removed yourself from a possibly interesting situation. <laughs> well... You know, I, I don't care what other people do with their lifestyle, but I have my lifestyle. Right, so. exactly. <laughs> and I remember, I feel like I remember that from being in the, lock, like, in the field house locker rooms in college. I, there's a couple times where I'm like, uh, what, is she looking at me a certain way? <laughs> so it definitely yeah. can, happen, it can happen all over. <laughs> So when when you came out of the military, I've always wondered about this because I know um, I know we have had some chances to talk about what the adjustment was like. You know, having I, I mean, from what I understand, of Corsman, you guys are kind of first first point of contact with injury. You take care of a lot of things. You own a you own a lot of situations. Like you said, sometimes you guys even sort of see patients. And coming out of that and into the civilian world, where you sort of had to restart, what was that transition like? It was rough, and I still have problems with it today because I actually enjoyed the military, and I miss being in it, but I had to do what was best for me and my daughter. But the transition was, it was very difficult because coming from an environment where I'm told to do something and I'm expected to do it right then to being able to make the choice of, oh, well, I don't want to do that or... I don't have to do that, so I'm not going to. So I still have that mentality to do what I'm told. And sometimes it can get me in trouble <laughs> because sometimes it's not, it's not always the right thing to do, especially in nursing. I'll have one person tell me to go do something, and I'll be like, oh, okay, and then I'll stop, and I'll think about it. I'm like, wait a minute. I don't want to do that. <laughs> Yeah, you know, you like make your own judgment calls sometimes, right? Right, and it's it's still hard to think on my own, I guess, at times. I, I would say you're not the. I, I think it's amazing that you were able to just say that, but I think I've heard that from other members of the military, even officers, who said, you know, you get used to this lifestyle of do or die. This is your job. I said, do it, do it, and you always know who to defer to, exactly where your command is, and there's no real negotiation there. And then when you move into the workforce, there's so much gray. Yeah, there's there's a lot of gray. And then I guess you did mention your daughter is, you know, what was that like? I, I've always wondered with having your daughter and moving into a civilian life, you know, how, how, how did that, I mean, for the people who are listening who maybe don't know, how did that situation come about? And how did you sort of navigate going from being, you know, in the Navy to being a mother? Well, I've really didn't have a choice <laughs> <laughs> when it happened uh, it was either you adjust or you die it was kind of like the same military thing you either do it or you don't there's no in between so so you were still in the military when you found out you were pregnant yes wow how did how how was that process like you know well i was I was on the ship, and I couldn't be on the ship pregnant, so I got shipped back to the States and for, to Norfolk, and it was six months before I was getting out, so I stayed in Norfolk until I got out, and then I came home and had my daughter. Wow. So, so she's really never known, uh, you know, the, the Navy mom. <laughs> 
No. <laughs> and now instead of taking orders, you're giving them. <laughs> yes, and I kind of, I give them just like the drill instructors do sometimes. <laughs> I have to catch myself. <laughs> I love Vanessa that that you contrasted that that mentality of like you know like you said of not really having to think for yourself, and and as Holly pointed out, you always know who to defer to, and then now you do you have to think on your feet. You have to you're responsible for the you know for these post op patients, and now you really do have to stop and say, okay, I need to make my own judgment call and my own decision. It's just I find that so interesting because most people never have that. Bad contrasting types of careers, you know, in one lifetime. Yeah. Well, it's it's trialing at times. Like I said, I mean, there, I can think of one situation where a patient was saying that she was hurting, and I had my supervisor tell me, go give her some morphine. Well, being in the military, I kind of, you know, was like, oh, okay, I'm being told what to do. <laughs> go do it. Well, by the time I walked down the hall, I had time to think about it, and I'm like, wait a minute, this woman's O2 sets are in the freaking low 90s, she's comatose, <laughs> she won't stay awake longer than two or three minutes at a time, I'm not about to give her more morphine. So, you know, then I had to turn around and say, uh, no, I don't think that's a good idea, I'm not doing it, you can do it. Wow, yeah. So, I mean, it's just that I still have that, I'm... I'm given an order, so I immediately turn around to do it, but as I'm doing it, I'm also thinking, okay, well, is this a good thing or not? God, does that second guessing, has it gotten better over time? Because when, when did you leave um, the military and when did you come back to, civil, to civilian life? 2005. Oh, wow. Has it gotten any easier? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it, it's, I mean, I still, I still catch myself from time to time, but... I'd say the majority of the time I I think on my feet. I, I don't listen to what other people are telling me. I do what I think is right. And I don't I don't hold back when I say I don't feel that safe, so if you wanna do it, you go ahead at your license. I'm not losing mine. <laughs> and that's my favorite saying, is I'm not losing my license, you go do it. That's they absolutely. can't make that's a difference is they can't make me go do that. <laughs> so Yeah, that's that's actually pretty brilliant. I wish, I wish sort of all, I almost wish all nurses could have that experience because I think some of them sometimes are a little less clear, you know, <laughs> what's yeah. important. <laughs> yeah. They're just following. You're right. They're, they are taking the orders and not being as uh, uh, thinking of making their own judgment call like Vanessa now can stop and say, okay, no, I don't have to do that. <laughs> sort of gives yeah. you a better perspective, I guess, coming from what's literally sort of life and death, yes or no, to... Maybe that's not such a good idea. Um, so, yeah, I'm so, trying not to kill any patients off. <laughs> yeah, I think that sounds like a wise, a wise mantra. <laughs> don't lose my <laughs> lessons. Don't kill any patients. Don't lose my license. Don't kill any patients. <laughs> yeah. So I guess getting into the more fun part of the podcast, I've really enjoyed talking about your experience, and I'm sort of springing this on you, so it's okay if you're not down. But we uh, we have a game we like to play here called Good, Bad, or Indifferent. <laughs> And if you're up for it, I would love to play it with movies about being in the military. And you can tell us if you think they were good, bad, or if you're just sort of indifferent to them. Like if you think it was a good depiction, bad depiction, or totally indifferent. Okay. All right. And, we're, and we'll play too, so don't worry. You won't be the only. Uh, we'll, we also, Jill and I love this game. It's a little bit. We're, we're not putting you on the spot by yourself. <laughs> Holly's putting me oh, on Oh, no. Spot. I'm just afraid I might not have seen some of those movies. <laughs> oh, that's probably okay. I mean, you know, you can always say you haven't seen it or, you know, that's that's all right. We allow that here. Um, so, I'm. have you seen G.I. Jane? Yes. Okay. I'm deathly curious. Good, bad, or indifferent? It was a good. It was good. <laughs> that, I mean, it, it was kind of like what it was like going through boot camp. So would a, would a woman ever be able to do that? I mean, the, would the military allow it? Or would if, if she were what seems to me to almost be like parahuman the way that uh, Demi Moore was in that movie. But, I mean, like if she could handle it, could a woman really become a SEAL? I doubt it. I don't <laughs> think they'll ever allow that. <laughs> That was the thing I thought was the craziest thing about the whole movie. I was like, this is an awesome movie, but I just have trouble seeing how this would happen in real life. But at least I'm, I'm glad to know that the depictions of boot camp were pretty dead on. That actually yeah, is I, interesting. And Vanessa, why, wouldn't you, why don't you think they'll allow women to, to become Navy SEALs? Well, I think that 
it would be too much of a distraction for the men and yeah. that there are too many narrow-minded men out there that would make sure that it didn't happen. Yeah. Not unless well, I, we get, like, a female president or something. <laughs> yeah. Well, I figured that maybe, I mean, knowing that what those Navy SEALs missions are like, that the, it's almost like the quarters would be too close, like close quarters and, like you said, that distracting. I mean, they can't, there can be no distractions, right, when they're going in and training for their stuff and going in to do, like, for instance, getting Osama, Osama bin Laden. I mean, so I would think that that would be tough to mix the genders in that type of training and that type of execution. Oh, yeah. That it wouldn't, I don't think, I don't think it'd be wise. And I know women that I served with that could make it through SEAL training without a problem. Mm-hmm. That's kind you of know, cool they, could, they could handle their own, but I just, I don't think it would be a good idea because of the, jobs that they do there's there's still that man and woman animal love type tension. relationship yeah. <laughs> yeah tension sexual tension yeah yeah i bet um holly sorry get off topic uh, get off our movie <laughs> no that was awesome i mean for that reason i would probably say it was bad because i remember growing up thinking after gi jane i could be a navy seal <laughs> <laughs> Which I know I probably would never do, but back then I totally thought I could do it. <laughs> what about you, Jill? Well, I well I'm gonna I have a I have another movie to throw out, but first as far as GI Jane, I'm kind of indifferent. I, I I saw it, but I don't remember it. It didn't leave an impression <laughs> on me. Um, so yeah, I'm sort of. In, I mean, I liked. I thought Demi Moore was great in it. Um, but so I have another military movie, which is one of my favorite movies of all time which is A Few Good Men, <laughs> um, and I wondered what you thought. Holly, we'll bounce to you first and give Vanessa a chance to think. <laughs> okay, I'm not knowing anything about anything. I think it's good because, to me, it showed sort of both sides of the coin of the kind of, like, the decisions that have to be made have to be made with that, like, cold-blooded idea of if you're in a life-or-death situation will you be able to survive? And if you can't, we probably shouldn't send you into a life or death situation sort of thing. And I mean, and how I guess that can make some people crazy. But for me, I thought it was good because it definitely made me sort of rethink what the military is actually about, which as a kid, you think it's just like, you know, I was one of those girls who's like, I can do anything the boys can do. And, you know, spitting and kicking and playing soccer and, you know, baseball up until, up until literally up until the first time I got hit with the baseball and my father forgot, quote unquote, forgot to sign me up the next year, <laughs> you know, and so when you, you even said you played baseball later, you know, and I thought, well, I can do anything a boy can do so I can be in the military. And I remember seeing a few good men and thinking there was a reality there beyond just being really tough. There's a reality there of life or death, do or literally do or die. And also the reality that sometimes people die and not necessarily in battle, you know, sometimes people die, you know, and sometimes the the mentality of preparing someone for war can be almost war itself. Yeah. So I guess for that reason, I think it's good. Have you seen A Few Good Men, Vanessa? Yeah, I have. I'm just trying to remember which one. Was that the one with, um, it's Jack uh, Nicholson and Tom Cruise and, and Demi Moore. You can't okay. handle the truth. Yeah, it's the, yeah, it's, yeah. Okay, yeah, I remember. Yeah, it's Guantanamo, Guantanamo, and um, so, you know the. It's the, almost as much of a courtroom movie as it is a war. Yeah, where they really where more they beat court. somebody up, where they called a red coat or whatever it was. I, yeah. Um, um, I I mean it was a good movie, but I don't think it necessarily portrayed the military as how it really is. Um, I mean not to say that that sort of stuff doesn't happen but it it just gave a a very bad impression of the military yeah that's not how the military is right almost like an uncaring yeah oh you know what it was a a, a big premise of the movie was the cover up the cover up of the the code red that was ordered for Santiago. See, I know this movie inside and out. <laughs> yeah, I have seen it so many times because it's always on. <laughs> so yeah, I think that's a good point. It does. It kind of paints the it it paints it in a bad light. Yes, it does. I mean, it was a good movie, but 
Dramatic. But you also got to, I mean, if you look at where they were, they're in, you know, Guantanamo Bay, you know, a, a desolate little island where you can only stay on base. You're not allowed out in town or anything like that. And it's where the prison is, I think. And I don't know. It just wasn't realistic to me. No, I think that I think that makes sense. What about you, Jill? You're one of your favorites of all time. <laughs> yeah, well, I just like that. I, I like the the plot line, um, and I like the acting. You know, I mean, between uh, Tom Cruise and 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 you know who's in there is Kevin Bacon. Love I Kevin. I love Kevin Bacon. <laughs> <laughs> and of course Jack, and all his lines. I mean, I feel like I we my husband and I walk around the house. You know, maybe not as much now, but they, those there would always be those quotes. It's one of those movies that gets quoted a lot around here. <laughs> um, so it, I loved it, but I can I see Vanessa's point about the negative. You know, the negative light and the and there it was. It was all the cover up and the cover ups and stuff. So. Um, all right, Holly, do you have any other military movies for us? I was going to ask Vanessa if she had one. Had one before you asked me. <laughs> Sorry, I know, isn't that the worst? It's like on the tip of my tongue. <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, well, I'll throw, I'll, if you want, I'll throw one in while you think about it. Uh, go more uh, pile. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> no, not the TV series, the, the guy. Oh, the movie? Um, yeah, the movie. I'm trying to think of the name of it where it was. Marine Corps boot camp, and the drill instructor was always hammering him, called him Gomer Powell, and he was oh. fat and overweight. Oh, which which one, which movie was that? Ah, Jill, do you have any idea which movie this is? I'm so curious. Um, the only thing I can think of is Stripes, but I don't think that's it. <laughs> no, it's not Stripes. You know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna Google it actually. <laughs> Holly, throw yours out there while you're. What's your movie that you had? Then well, we'll of come course, back. I I'm enjoying something. With oh, oh no! It. What's oh. the one with Goldie? Private Benjamin. Private Private ben. Benjamin. Yeah. I that's <laughs> good. That's a good one, Vanessa, because Goldie Hawn's the main. The, the, she's the main character. She's a woman. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that, so that was a good movie, but it wasn't realistic either. <laughs> He kind of played the whole ditzy, dit, ditzy, ditzy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. She wore way too much makeup to be in the mil for, for, to really be in the military. <laughs> oh yeah, they limit the amount of makeup we wear. So yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. What yeah. The, what can you wear for makeup? I mean, you can wear makeup. It just has to be in good taste. Hmm. In good taste. That's your rule. <laughs> Yeah, in good taste. Huh. Along with the hard clothing to that too. Would be, that would be that would be easy to stick to because you know a lot of people don't have very good taste and what they may think of as being in good taste. That's so subjective. Like I, I'm surprised because I know you know my best friend from growing up was she was in the Air Force. She was ROTC, and so which you know is probably a little bit of the fake, um, <laughs> fake Air Force. But then she went in as an officer, you know, after college, and she had to pin up her hair you know you can't wear your hair down unless it's short and then if you have longer hair you have to wear it up and it because it has to be like there's a certain number of inches it has to be you know like where it can't touch your your you know your your collar of your shirt or whatever it was very precise about the hair so I'm surprised that the makeup was so vague that you know vague and subjective uh to say just in good taste well uh it was I mean they tried to say in moderation and in good taste, uh -huh. but there were so many people that didn't use it moderately, but <laughs> I never saw anyone actually get in trouble for having too much makeup on. Now, I've seen them get sent home because it wasn't in good taste. It was all crazy colors, and uh -huh. you know, they want you to wear neutral colors, not anything bright and flashy. Huh. Oh wow! I, I actually am curious about. Did you have hair hair rules also? I didn't even think about hair rules. Yeah, you just have to have it two inches above your collar. Oh, see, two inches. There you go. I knew no. it. <laughs> Does it have to be cut to two inches above your collar? Or it has, to, or it can be put up. Uh, no, it can be put up. I put mine up in a bun every day. Wow. Yeah. So that it, it had to has be to pinned up. <laughs> Is that just because they think it'll get in the way of your duties, or just? To give a uniform well, effect, sort of like a high and tight? Yeah, it's, I don't think it's for a uniform effect. I think it's, um, one, I mean, if your hair is down, it gets in the face, and depending on your job, your 
pulling, you're too worried about getting your hair pulled out of your face and doing your job or, you know, and it, and it looks good if your hair is up in a bun, you got your hat on and your uniform on, it just looks better, I guess. Cause it does look kind of silly. I've put on my hat just messing around with friends with hair pulled down and stuff and I don't look like military. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's not neat enough. Right. Right. Yeah. Oh, so interesting. It, it, and to think about those things that like the men don't even, you know, they just get there. Like you said, they're, they're buzz cut, they're high and tight and they're good to go. They don't have to worry about makeup or anything. <laughs> um, yeah. Huh, so interesting. Well, um, Holly, I have a couple of Memorial Day um, tidbits. So when we're just, but I'll save them for the end. So I just want to see if you want to do any good, bad, more good, bad, and indifferent. No, I'm good. I'm really, I'm impressed. And I love the Private Benjamin because that totally brought it to the era in which I watched a lot of movies. <laughs> so I loved me some Private Benjamin. Yeah. It's very enjoyable, actually. <laughs> I'm going to have to see that one again. I know, it's pretty awesome. So I guess the best thing we could do here is, Vanessa, just thank you for your service. And more importantly, thank you for sharing the stories about it with us because, you know, there may be women out there who are looking to do what you did. And are there any are there any words of encouragement or advice you have for the ladies who are thinking about maybe going into the military now? Well, the military has changed. It changed while I was serving. So it's not quite as hard as it used to be um as far as physical wise they have like uh these little blue cards that they give you where if you're getting too stressed you can throw out your blue card and they give you a time out pretty much which kidding I think me? Is ridiculous. <laughs> wow no, I'm not kidding There's you on battle. <laughs> oh my God. but uh this is only time uh-huh. This is during, I, I guess this is more during a peacetime um, on a peace, a base that's... Uh, during that's, training. Yeah, during training. Yeah. So... Sorry, I got you a little off topic. It's changed, but um, I think anybody that wants to join the military, um, you have to have your heart set on it. You have to want to do it because it is an adjustment. It is a huge change of lifestyle. And it takes a lot of mental anguish to get through it. <laughs> Not to mention the physical aspect, but the mental. Um, yeah. The mental was a lot harder for me. It was a big challenge. But anybody can do it. You just have to set your mind to it and know that it's only a short period of time, a boot camp, and then it's just like a regular job. You go to work every day. You come home. It's not nearly as bad as some of the movies portray it. So it's that initial toughness that you have to have, which is what, which is, I guess, how everyone is weeded out, right? That's right. Huh. Cool. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, yes, for serving our country. For It sounds like you were in for eight years. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, that's that's a that's a solid amount of time. Yeah, and thank you for, for being on with us and sharing and being so open about talking about your experience. No, you're welcome. It was a pleasure. And we just, we just, I, well, I can speak for me. I just love you. And I'm so glad that you came on to the podcast. And thanks for, again, for sharing your story. And we will talk to you again soon. Well, thanks for thinking of me, Holly. <laughs> time. Have a good, have a good night. Have a good weekend. Happy Memorial Day. Yeah. Thank you. You too. So, Holly, I did find a couple tidbits about Memorial Day. Since it's Ooh, been. Memorial Day tidbits. Memorial <laughs> Everybody do a silent cheer. <laughs> so this one is from Metuchen, New Jersey. And it's um, they have a parade every year going all the way back to, well, I don't know, 1927. And this year, the Metuchen, New Jersey Memorial Day Parade is honoring the women in the military. And that's their theme, honoring our women in the military. And the Grand Marshals are both one from the Air Force, who was in Vietnam, and then the other one was Army Air Corps, representing World War II. 
Uh, so there's, they've got some, you know, all sorts of different ages and represented here, women that have served, veterans. And uh, so I just thought that was kind of nice. that Oh, well, we them. should tell them, you know, they don't have anyone from the Navy. They could get Vanessa in there. They could, yeah. She could come right up for that. She could be a grand marshal this year in the Matatchee, <laughs> New Jersey. <laughs> I'm still not pronouncing it exactly right, but I just thought that was kind of you know, neat. Ma touching, me touching. Yeah, it's it's a lovely word. Anyway, sorry. Go ahead, Jill. Tip That's it. okay. So that was the one. I just sort of that, thought that was neat. That just since we do the this our all women's podcast, I thought it would be neat to mention that they were having a. A, a Memorial Day parade honoring women's veterans, women veterans. And then the other thing is actually much closer to home, which is in my town, my home, now my new hometown of Norfolk, Massachusetts. And they actually did what they're calling a field of flags this year. So we have a town common, you know, it's a little kind of New England for a typical New England town with a white church in the middle and a library, you know, public library. And it's very New England country and rustic looking. And our town common, we actually refer to it as the town hill. And this year, for specifically for Memorial Day weekend, the Norfolk Lions Club decided to do a fundraiser in conjunction with it's the high, uh, a, a group at the local high school. And they wanted to get 1,000 American flags. They were ten dollars a piece, and and so people bought these flags, and they were they were placed in on our town hill. So when you drive by, there is a one thousand flags, you know, a field of flags. It's just beautiful, and all of the proceeds, which I guess was over twelve thousand dollars, so twelve grand, went to the Fisher House, Boston, which is a place for military families to stay while their loved ones are receiving treatment at the at the veterans hospital nearby. So I thought that was such a neat, a neat fundraiser, a neat, a great idea for our, our Lions Club, the service organization, our town to do to raise money for the Fisher House and to have this beautiful field of flags on our town hill. So and it's going to stay and we will attend my family will attend the Memorial Day Parade on Monday morning. My kids are both. I've got one Cub Scout and one Girl Scout. Our, our Daisy, as she's known. <laughs> they're daisies when they're little Girl Scouts. And they're both going to march in the Memorial Day Parade, you know, and it's, it's just a neat, it's just this very home, you know, small town uh, kind of neat tradition. So I just wanted to, to mention that as well. I think that's amazing. And, uh, you know, I guess it's safe for us to say, Jill and I, from everybody here at BaseNet and especially everybody here at Crashing Glass, you all of the veterans out there, not just the women, we are so thankful for your service. In all honesty, we like to joke around a lot on the show. We have a good time, but this is something totally serious to us and near and dear to our hearts. And we just hope you have a great Memorial Day weekend. Yep. Happy Memorial Day. Thank you.